Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Come on, we're going to stand and we're going to praise God this Easter morning. Let everything. Let everything. Let us breath. Let us breath. Praise the Lord. Happy Easter. 
We are so glad that all of you are here today. We have more people coming in all the time. So before we get started, if you have space between you and the people next to you, if you could shift to your right and then we could open up that space for other people who are waiting to find seats, that would be super, super helpful. We are really glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us this Sunday morning here at Foundry. My name is Chris, and, uh, and I'm just really excited that we get to celebrate this Sunday morning together. If you're new, um, if you haven't been with us before, or if you haven't been with us in a long time, I want to encourage you to do uh, something for me. On the seat backs in front of you, we have these Connect cards. These Connect cards help us get to know who you are just a little bit, and it helps us connect with you and help you get connected uh, with different ministries here at Foundry so we can help you as you journey along in your faith. On the back side of that card, there are prayer requests. If anyone in this room has prayer requests that they want to share uh, here with us here at Foundry, we would love to join with you in prayer. Now, a lot of times when we think about prayer requests, we think about uh, hardships. Maybe there's an illness. Maybe there's a loss of job. Um, whatever it is, we want to join with you in that. But we also believe um, that the, the, when the Bible says weep with those who weep, it also says rejoice with those who are rejoicing. So maybe you just got a promotion. Maybe you're going to have a new grandbaby. Maybe there is something good happening in your life and you want, uh, you want to share that with us as well, we would be honored to be able to celebrate with you good things happening in your life. So fill out that prayer request card. You can drop it off in the box in the back or on the side over here. Uh, we just want to get to know you a little bit, and this is a great time uh, for us to make that happen. Uh, it's a special Sunday. It's a really special Sunday, obviously. Um, Easter is a time where we celebrate in a special and a unique way. In Romans Chapter 10, it says this, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Guys, as we worship this morning, as we celebrate together, that is a confession from our mouth of what's going on in our heart, what we believe in our heart and in our mind. This is a time for us to confess who Jesus is, that we celebrate a king who's alive. And what I love about that is if, if all Jesus did, if the only thing he did was die so that he, we, he could pay for the sins that we committed and save us in that way, if all he did was take on the payment of our sins, we would have a lot to celebrate today. But he didn't stop there. Three days after he died, he was raised, he was brought into new life so that we could have new life as well. And I think that's really worth celebrating. Again, if all he did was save us from our punishment, he'd be worthy of praise, but he gave us new life also. So this morning as we sing, as we worship, this is a time for that confession of our mouth to reflect the condition of our heart. So I want to encourage us as we continue to worship to sing loud, sing, sing boldly this confession of faith. Let that, let that confession grow and grow throughout the service as we continue in worshiping. Let's stand together. We're going to pray, and then we're going to continue singing songs. God, we're so thankful that this morning we have a lot to celebrate. We're so thankful that we have a lot to appreciate about who you are. God, we're so thankful that you sent Jesus. And Jesus, we're so thankful to you for living the life that we couldn't live, dying and paying a punishment that we couldn't pay. And then being raised up and giving us a life that goes far beyond this one. Holy Spirit, we're thankful that you live in us and indwell us and give us confidence in those truths. And that as we sing these words, that, that they're simply a reflection of a changed life and a changed heart. Be with us this morning as we continue in worship. Help us to celebrate boldly and loudly, all in truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, let us. Back. 
the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on the grave has no claim on us, amen? Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. No matter where you are today, we're so glad that you joined us for this very special celebration. Here at Foundry, we are all about helping people to know, follow, and share Jesus. Because we know the difference in our own lives, in the lives of our families, and in the lives of the world around us when we encounter Jesus Christ. So, while we are glad you're here, we really hope you discover more to faith than just a nice Sunday experience. We want to help kids, students, and adults take their next step with God whatever that might look like. We wanna be the kind of church family that helps people grow in their relationship with Jesus. So whether it's kids ministry, student ministry, or any of our ministries here at Foundry, we would love to partner with you and have you come and serve alongside of us. And we know and believe that Jesus is inviting all of us to be a part of his mission. It's done better together through communities and families right here at Foundry. We would love for you to be a part of it. And because Jesus has demonstrated his love for us, each Easter, we take up a special offering that goes outside of the walls of this church. That's why we're so excited to announce our partnership with the Methodist Church of Costa Rica. And that's a special thing for me because that's where I'm from. We hope to come alongside six different churches on the West Coast with the hopes of planting a new church within three to five years. So you can go to foundrychurch.org or you can use the give cards that are in your seats in front of you. Anything that's given today will go towards this effort. Thank you for helping us to make a difference in the world. And thank you for joining us today. We'd love for you to find a home here with us. Jesus paid our debt on the cross. And I don't know about you, but I am so, so thankful I did. Oh, we bless your name, Jesus. Oh, your name, God. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as
He was in white as snow. Let's sing it again, every voice. Let's sing it one more time, even louder unto the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for what you did on Calvary's cross, bruised for our iniquities, God but by your stripes we are healed and we are made whole. And we thank you for rising again for us, Lord. We thank you that you paid our debt. You said that we are not guilty in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for, for all that you did for us, God. And we thank you for the word that's going to go forth today. May it penetrate our hearts, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. Jesus, you are so, so good and worthy of all of our praise. So we lift you up and we magnify you in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Let us all say amen, amen, and amen. Let's give Jesus the praise. Hallelujah. You may take your seat. Stories have a way of shaping our lives. I grew up in an immigrant household here in the United States and seeing the story of my parents unfold, watching them struggle, watching them overcome incredible obstacles, including language obstacles, and yet be able to achieve great things in their life has shaped the way I'm present in this life. I would hear things around the house like Junior, that's what they called me. That wasn't just a nickname, because named after my dad. They'd say, Junior, you know, you're blessed. So now you have to be a blessing to others. And that began to frame the way I would view things and shapes the way I'm, I'm present with other folks. A story has the power to change us for good only in the measure that it captures our imagination and curiosity if we're able to actually see ourselves in the story. If not, it's just simply a story in somebody else's life. In 2016, a study conducted by Jay Colbin found that people spend a great deal of time engaging in narrative fiction in the form of novels, picture books, films, television shows, podcasts, and video games. Television viewing alone accounted for five hours per day, totaling over 76 days per year for the average American adult. That's a lot of TV. On the surface, we're blown away by the amount of time, but then it also begs the question of what is it within us that causes us to spend so much time watching stuff that is made up or things that have never happened and never will happen, but yet it seems to capture us. As they dug deeper in the study, they found that these stories are not just an enjoyable space for us to escape our current realities, but they all give us insight into our world, into how to live life. So keep watching all the TV you want. Like, Mom, this gives me insight into life. This is why I want to watch so much TV. Here's the reality. All of us are looking for some kind of insight into how to do better in this life. I even get a little bit impatient when I'm in, in general, but in certain circumstances when I'm trying to just do me and somehow you're forced into someone else's story. Visited a few amusement parks, theme parks over spring break and as you're standing in line and after you've been standing there for 90 minutes, you feel like you're almost at the ride 
and now you're gonna get immersed into their world. This is great, I've seen the movie, can I just get on that dang ride? I just want to enjoy those three and a half minutes, if that, so that I can say I did it. But they go through great lengths to try to include you in the story. When I'm playing a video game, sometimes they give you the backstory. I don't know if you guys can relate to that. Some people are like, oh, this is great, you gotta watch this. I'm like, can, I'm waiting for the X to pop up that I can press so that it can actually load the game and let's go on, let's play. Stories can inspire us, they can motivate us, they'll challenge us, yet not every story has the power to change who we are. After three years of teaching and performing miracles, Jesus of Nazareth became enough threat to the Roman Empire and also to the religious leaders that were in Jesus' day that he was finally brought up on Trump charges and charged with insurrection and finally sentenced to death. Jesus was executed on a Roman cross between two criminals. The one who claimed to be God's anointed, the one who was to come and to save the world, seemingly lost the battle against evil on a dark Friday afternoon. His body was washed and wrapped in burial clothes, and then from that cross he was laid on a tomb that was borrowed and sealed with a large stone. Everyone thought that that was the end of the story. But the story continues. Mark's gospel records it this way. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb when they asked each other, who will roll, roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now remember, the Jewish past uh, Sabbath was on Saturday, so this is early Sunday morning, which is the reason we gather every Sunday morning as Christ followers to celebrate the resurrected Christ. And they're going back to the tomb, and these, these women are simply going to embalm the body. There's no indication in, the, in this passage that we just read or before that they're expecting to find an empty tomb. They're expecting to find a body. And yet they were overwhelmed when they walked to the tomb. They are full of grief and hopelessness. They had to be wondering, this couldn't have been the savior of the world. A guy with a really good heart did some really cool things, but what in the world? And they're, they're distraught, and they're thinking through all the logistics. There gotta be Roman soldiers in front of this tomb. How in the world are we going to remove this stone from this tomb? I don't know if you've ever had to plan a funeral in the midst of incredible grief. I imagine this is what they're feeling right now. I can't just hide in a corner and cry and grieve. I got to now deal with all of this. Their hopes of Jesus being the one that would come and save the entire world, their hopes for the Messiah to have finally come, their hopes are dashed. They are distraught and full of sadness. But the story continues. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone that was very large had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, kind of creepy and cool at the same time, on the right side, and they were alarmed. So if they're alarmed, the guy says, hey, don't be alarmed. It's like when somebody's kind of altered, and they're like, hey, calm down. Does that ever work for you? When somebody tells you to calm down, does it help? Like, oh, that's what I needed to hear. Thanks, that was so much. But these, these ladies are alarmed, and they says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, Peter was away from his disciples, and go ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, if you've grown up hearing the story within the church, it's so easy to simply read these verses and say, yeah, Jesus is risen. I don't think we understand the magnitude of what was just declared here. For other people, this story of Jesus being raised from the dead is simply far-fetched. They simply discard it as a cute little story, a story of fiction that might give us insight into our own lives, may not, or simply a great Jewish legend. Back in the 1720s in Germany, there was a guy by the name of Baron Munchausen. And after retiring from the military, he would tell all these crazy endeavors that he supposedly did. 
And if you don't know, anybody know this guy? Known as the Baron, beautiful man, beautiful man, great hat. And he would tell all these stories, these lavish endeavors that he was part of. He talked about that he would ride on a cannonball through the air, or that he traveled underwater on a horseback, or that he threw the hatchet all the way to the moon, or that he fought a 40-foot alligator at one point, or crocodile, and that he danced inside the belly of a fish. And he would set, tell all these stories straight-faced and very matter-of-fact as if they actually happened, which started catching the attention of all the people around, especially the riders of that day. So they started writing stories based on his tales. He was immortalized as the fantastic comic character. No one took his stories seriously. He was simply reduced to a comic character. I'm sure these stories provided some kind of entertainment for folks, but I doubt they changed anyone's life. See, given Jesus' life and claims, he is either a comic character, the best con artist you've ever seen, or he's actually the Christ that he claimed to be. It's the claim of C.S. Lewis that Jesus was either Lord, lunatic, or a liar. All of those, depending on what you choose, has implications for the way that you're present in your life. See, if Jesus and his disciples were making this stuff up, there is no way that this con would have gone for this long, for hundreds and thousands of years to the day we live today. But let's play it out for a second. If you were trying to pull off the greatest con of all time, if I was, which I think would be cool to try, if I'm being honest, I don't think I would do it like Jesus did. Hey guys, I'm the Messiah. And now he's dying, beaten, humiliated, berated, ridiculed, and died on a cross. I might have left that part out. And if you're gonna go out, would you go out swinging? Would you kick some butt, Jesus, before you left? At least bring some justice to the injustice we've been facing. He did some cool things, but I would have done it differently. At least would have added some veracity to his story, a little sting to what he actually had to say. See, because the world saw Jesus die. Those closest to Jesus saw him die. Those who were coming in town over the Passover who had heard of Jesus saw him die. They saw him upon that cross dead because everyone believed that this was the guy that was to come to redeem Israel. And yet when they saw him on that cross, all the messianic hope completely crushed and also crucified. Jesus' eyewitness accounts are also a little suspect, even by the world's standards. Scripture records that over 500 followers witnessed the risen Lord. Here's a snapshot of all the different scriptures that say they saw Jesus, all the different accounts. Now, if all these people were lying about Jesus' resurrection, all the Roman authorities had to do in that moment was to roll out the body and say, here. And it's done. No more prayers, no more writing, no more gatherings, no more evangelization, no more proclamation of life. It's done. But they couldn't produce the body because they didn't have it. Jesus revealed himself to those closest to him, and word started to spread. But what I find fascinating is that the first people who receive word to start spreading the word are women. And it's like, yeah, tell a woman something, and they go tell the whole world. This is not what this is about <laughs> at all. In the first century, women were not eligible to testify within the Jewish court system. So the testimony of a woman is automatically thrown out and dismissed. So if you're trying to pull over a fast one on people, the greatest con ever known to mankind, women as your marketing team is a horrible fail. You'd recruit someone in the community that was well-known, well-connected, respected, pay them and let them go along with the story and then you'll have a better shot. But this is the way that God tends to work. It's very different than the way you and I tend to work. Because they don't make sense to us, they don't make sense to the world. 
Because the gospel says if you want to be first, you got to be last. If you want glory, you have to go through suffering. If you want to be exalted, you must be humbled. If you want to find yourself, lose yourself. If you want to be rich, become poor. And if you want to live, you have to die. Pick up your cross and follow me. This was the message of Jesus. And God has a habit of of picking the the least, the last, the lost, the unexpected, the broken, and show himself among us to reveal his power and love. And in this story, he chooses women. Part of me says, I think it demonstrates the vastness of the power of his resurrection. And then Thomas, one of the 12, now 11 left. When he got word that Jesus was alive, he was super skeptical. He's like, yeah, I I believed his lies before. He said he was the one. He said he would overcome everything. But you know what? Unless I see him with my own eyes, I don't think I'm going to believe. I'm not going to fall for this one again. Fool me once, fool me, what, something, how does it go? He says, I simply won't believe. The truth is, like Thomas We often rely on disbelief to save our pride, or we're stubborn enough to protect ourselves from further disappointment. However, a week later, Jesus appears to Thomas. He doesn't berate him or beat him up for doubting. It's like, man, how stupid are you? I told you, I promised you. He didn't say anything like that. Instead, Jesus is gentle with Thomas. He says, Tom, Tommy, look at me. It's me, Jesus. Look at my scars. Want to feel my wound? It's me. And at that moment, Thomas had to make a decision. Do I stay stuck in my pride? Or do I give in and believe what I've known to always be true? See, he could have made up another excuse See, Jesus walked in, and he's like, nah, man, that's, that's AI. I don't believe it. You can't believe anything these days. Because one of the things that always captured my attention when I read the gospel story about the resurrection is that Jesus, who had been with his disciples for three years, sleeping, sharing quarters with them, breaking bread with them, all of a sudden, he appears to them, and they don't recognize him. It's like his body has been glorified. It's different than what they've known. And yet, it's the same Jesus. He looks differently, but the wounds are still there. See, an encounter with the resurrected Christ caused something to shift within Thomas' heart. And Thomas responds to Jesus, my Lord and my God. This declaration of dependence upon God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's us. We weren't there. I don't care how old you are, you weren't there when Jesus came back from the dead. I like, I like to think that if I was there during Jesus' day and I'd seen what scriptures say that he did, that I would be the one to say, you know what, I believe. Man, if they told me that Jesus was alive, I'd be like, yeah, totally, because he said it. He's that guy. I'd also like to think that a couple of days before that, like Peter, who denied Jesus three times, I would have denied him three times. There's no way, because I'm loyal, I'm faithful, this is who I am. One time, maybe, but three? No, I, I don't think so. I like to think that. I think we all like to think that. But the reality is that we're broken. And we struggle to believe. We struggle to be faithful. See, if we're honest, this is where we are many times. See, Jesus approached Thomas and so many others. He wasn't just asking them to believe in an event, in a historical event that had just occurred. When you're asked to believe, it's not just simply to acknowledge something that happened in the past 2,000 years ago. As significant as the event may be, he wants us to experience the fullness of his power and his love in our lives here and now. So looking and studying and analyzing all the evidence around the resurrection of Jesus is important, but the evidence itself will not bring about new life in you or in me. It's only a personal encounter with Christ that is able to do that. The disciples were not only confronted with the evidence of the resurrection, but they were marked by their encounter with the living Christ. 
the followers of Jesus went on to lay down their lives because of their faith in Jesus. Despite severe persecution and gruesome death, they never recanted their faith in Christ. The two Jameses we read about were killed, one with a sword and the other with a club. The Deus was shot with arrows. Simon Peter was crucified upside down. Simon was sawed in half. Luke was also hanged. Thomas was stabbed to death. And Paul was beheaded. Never once, when all that was happening, he said, like, time out! I was just joking! We hit it! Here's a treasure map. Go find the body. I'm good. I just want to live my life. Leave me alone. We almost got away with it. See, no one ever gives up their life for something you kind of believe in. Not, nobody does. Faith in Jesus Christ is not easy. If you're wanting faith in God to simply get away from your problems in life, you're in the wrong place. The call for us is a faith in Christ that will require something of us. Everything in life that is worthwhile, that you truly treasure and value, will cost you something. Will cost you something at the depths of your soul. The question is, are you willing to do it? Where, where's your devotion? Where's your affection? A faith in Christ is not just saying, yeah, I believe. It's God, this is my life. And here's what I'm willing to do. And I believe these guys were able to, to go to the very end until death, believing in Jesus because there's something deep and eternal that happened in them. The resurrection story became their story. Without the resurrection of Christ, we might as well shut it down and go home and don't come back next week. Because none of it matters. It's the conquering of sin and death through Christ's resurrection that it allows our faith to come alive. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. And the faith that we proclaim is useless. And all of us who declare Christ would be considered liars because we've proclaimed that God raised Christ from the dead. And if Christ never was raised from the dead, then you and I and the entire world will still be dead in our sins, lost and walking aimlessly throughout life. Theologian Eric Sawyer says, the resurrection is the public display of victory, the triumph of the crucified one, but the victory itself is complete. It is finished. Peter would later record it this way. For we did not follow cleverly devised little stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This wasn't a made up story. And here's the deal. I can't prove it to you. No one can. But in that same manner, no one can disprove it. No one. Even those who encountered Jesus after the resurrection had at some point to make a decision to take a step of faith to actually believe. It was more than just the, the assertion of the reality that he's standing there. Yep, he's alive. Can I go back riding my camel? Thank you very much. It was more than that. See, seeing Jesus alive would suddenly recall every single claim and declaration that Jesus ever made about himself, about humanity, about death, about life, about the kingdom of God. Everything would be recalled in that moment. Our faith in Christ is not blind or uninformed. It's rooted in real life events, just like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But regardless of what you believe, whether it's religious or not, it will require some level of faith and trust in you. During March Madness, talking to different people, talking about, my school's the best school. I'm not gonna mention any schools because it's Easter. We got a lot of folks in here that I don't know. <laughs> but the arguments made require a certain amount of faith. Some schools require a lot more faith for them to believe it's the best school. I talk to folks about their financial investments and they talk to me and they say, this is the way to go. And they're very secure in what they believe. At the end of the day, when you push down and push through it, at the end of the day, there's a level of faith that is involved because you bring your own presuppositions and assumptions to the table. 
because we are biased beings and we bring our presuppositions, our assumptions, our preconceived notions, everything. Because at some point when you press in, you press in, you press in, you're unable to explain every single detail of why you believe what you believe. There's things we simply have to accept by faith. Even the relationships that we're in, that, that we hold so dear to our hearts, will require trust and faith in order for them to flourish. I remember talking to a woman at a bar once, and she said she didn't believe in God because she said believing in God, in that kind of faith, she said, is foolish. And we kept talking about her life and everything else that was going on and work and yada, yada, yada. Then she started talking about her family and how supportive her parents had been of her. And I listened. And she focused on her dad and how much her dad loved her. And then I asked her, how do you know your father loves you? And she just stared at me and I said, prove it. Just prove it. So she started to share all the different things her father had done for her throughout her life. And how he was present, how was this? But I, and I said, how do you know he really loves you, though? As we pressed into the conversation, she finally said, I guess I just have to trust him when he says he loves me. I said, isn't that a bit foolish? Everything will require some kind of faith. The question is, what's the object of your faith? Hebrews 11 defines it this way. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. This passage, we see central in this passage, the feature of faith is confidence or trust. The object of faith is God and his promises. This phrase, things hoped for, insinuates that it's in the future, it's not here and now. You never hope for something in the past. You never hope for something you already have. You hope for something that's to come. Hope is always in the future. Grief is always in the past. And faith is based on the person of Jesus. Just as Jesus appeared to his doubting and fearful disciples, just as Jesus encountered these grieving and, and trembling women, just as Jesus drew near to Peter when he was riddled with regret and shame, I believe that Jesus continues to draw near to all of us, despite our doubts, our grief, our pain, our pride, our shame, our struggles, whatever it is we're facing, Jesus wants all of us to have a fresh encounter with him today. And it's out of that encounter that you and I have a relationship with Jesus that we begin to experience freedom and healing and peace and purpose for our lives. See, the women who showed up to this tomb weren't expecting an empty tomb. They were simply gonna take care of Jesus' corpse. But when they saw that the stone had been removed, God did part of the hard work for them. He says, now I want you to believe. Now I want you to trust. And this scary dude that was sitting there dressed in white tells them, gives them specific instruction to what they're supposed to go do. Scripture says this, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled the tomb and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. You think differently. They just encountered this. They had this beautiful encounter, supernatural encounter. They would go tell everybody. Well, they didn't. They were scared. See, they were just living their lives, going through life, going about their day, when they're confronted with the truth that Jesus is alive. I believe that many of you are going to be going through your day going through life like no big deal, doing what you do, and you're going to be confronted at some point with the reality that Jesus is alive. That story marked their lives forever. Yeah, they were afraid, but at that moment, even though they were afraid and chose not to tell someone, they had a decision to make. Are we going to stay in our fear, or are we going to trust what God is saying. What's it gonna be? When you say, when I say, I trust Jesus, what we're saying is I'm aligning my life to his teachings, to his love. The love of God comes to us wherever we've been, wherever, whatever we've done, regardless of what we've done. 
and fully manifested in the person of Jesus. He loves us so much that the love of God, wherever he finds us, doesn't leave us there. I think that's one of the things that, that the world teaches about love, that love just allows you to stay and wallow in whatever it is you're in. That's not true in scripture. That God died for us while we were still yet sinners, proving his love to us. And he says, I love you so much that I gave you my only begotten son, that whoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. And then he says, I will pick you up from that miry pit, I will cleanse you off, and I will set your feet on a solid rock, and then I will guide your steps. This is the love of God. It's not love to simply say, I see you there, hey, what's up? I love you, bye. That's not helpful, that's not rescuing. But he says, I love you so that I want you to be mine. I want you to come and follow me. And his love finds us and begins to change us from the inside out. And his love delivers us from sin and imparts eternal life into us. And that means that I start living my life according to his purposes, not mine. It might take a little bit to shift as I learn, as I grow. That's the Holy Spirit working in us. And coming to Christ doesn't mean that our lives are free of struggle. There's plenty of struggle in life. But it means that in the midst of our struggle, of our realities, of our dysfunction, and we're all dysfunctional to the core. In the midst of our real life stories, God continues to show up. And I don't know your story. Some of you have stories you've hidden in your heart's years and you're scared to share them all of us have been shaped by stories all of us have a story some of us tell ourselves a story every day the internal monologue stories of our in our heads these narratives shape who we are whether good or bad. These stories have enormous impact on our behavior and how we're present with other people. But I, but I wonder this morning, if we would allow the resurrection story to capture our curiosity a little bit, to capture our imagination. How could my life be different if Jesus Christ is really alive today? And still, See, resurrection, the resurrection story isn't just insight or tips on how to live my life better. It's a way of life. I come alive to something new. Our stories come alive and are redeemed when they're tethered to the resurrection story. The resurrection story has the power to bring about something amazing and new and lasting in and through our lives. Because the reality is of the resurrection, we go from death to life. We go from darkness to life, from fear to faith, from being blind to receiving sight, from being lost to being found and held, from being full of shame and guilt to now being free, from being broken and fragmented to being made whole in Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ available to the entire world. None of it's possible unless Jesus came back to life and he conquered it. The resurrection story continues to be played out in our everyday lives. Not just once a year when we remember it. We remember it in the manner in which we live according to his precepts. So whatever it is you're facing, if you're facing disease, you're facing disappointment, a broken heart, you're facing divorce, you're facing death in your life, in your family, let me tell you, you have a reason to sing. You're facing doubt, you have a reason to sing. I want, to invite, I want to invite all of us to stand right now. The band's gonna lead us in this closing song. And there's, there's power in the words that we declare and we're able to sing together. And you're like, well, I'm not, still not sure. I wanna encourage you to listen then. But I, want, I, want, want, I would love to hear every voice here sing out this song. The message is powerful. But it's a way of saying, God, I align to you. I believe you, I'm trusting you, and whatever it is you're facing, in a room this size with this many people, there's a, there's a lot of crap we're facing. And God doesn't just come to help us through that stuff. He says, in spite of all of that, I want to bring about life in you. 
and I want you to be a witness for me, for my goodness, for my love, for my life. So let's sing out together in Jesus' name. Come on, let's go out worshiping this Easter. On this glorious day. Victorious day. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried. It was my turn till I knew you come. sing out. Come on. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. May what we have declared with our lips this morning become a greater reality in our lives and all that we do and say. So let us leave in the assurance of God's love for us. 
that his spirit is moving in us, creating something new and creating the spaces in which we are to walk in and to live out this resurrected life. We always side with life because that's who he is. And that's what he invites us into. So go in his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You call my name.